Oh my god, Chris, you know what? What? I just realized my wife's car's stereo is broken. We can't listen to any music on our drive to see Machine Head. That's sad. I guess we'll just have to record a podcast instead. Yay! Oh, good thing we're already recording. Um... (laughs) Alright, this is Breathing Under Water's Music Cast. I am in the car with Chris. We're driving from Richmond, Virginia to Norfolk, Virginia, Norfolk, to go see Machine Head at the, at the Norva. Our stereo's broken in the car, so we decided to record a podcast instead. So, Chris, you know what this car ride reminds me of? It reminds me of our car rides in high school of our senior year when we used to go to um, community college. Yeah. And how we used to, I used to put on music and we used to rock out on our way to class. And um, from what I understand from some things that you've said and some of your writing that that played a bigger influence on your musical taste than I realized. So I thought we could have a little conversation about your musical journey and not to toot my horn or anything, but I, I am, am interested in, in the way that people get into music being a teacher and being around kids and watching their experiences with music or lack thereof. And um, sometimes I wonder if some kids' lives would be more enriched if they had a more diverse musical landscape to explore. So I'm always, I'm always curious about that, about how people get into music and why. So um, what would you say is, what was like your, your first introduction to music? What, what kind of got you into music originally? Well, aside from like Sesame Street songs or whatever, it was probably um, my dad had Phil Collins era Genesis CDs from the 80s, and that was my first concept of rock music, as it were. Did you like that? I actually did like it at the time. Um, Unlike other stuff that you know, you usually get your parents like that, you're like, oh, that's horrible. I actually do remember liking it. Even now, like I have, I'll put some of it on my iPod, and it's almost like, you know, a nostalgia factor. So, um, what then? What would you say your next step of evolution was in your musical interest? What What took you from the Phil Collinsy Genesis stuff to to the next thing? Because I know you're like a big REM fan and things like that. Was that that wasn't that was not current? Right, I mean that that didn't happen recently. So, what what was your next step? That was pretty much from my brother introducing me to the local Maryland, uh, DC alternative rock stations in the mid to late '90s, and so definitely REM, which was their I think '97 album, New Adventures in Hi-Fi. That um, that was the first CD I ever got. And so just instantly, R.E.M. became one of my favorites. And then just from there, it was just pretty much whatever was on the alternative rock radio at the time. Stuff my brother introduced me to. Um, As I teased the family, I was potentially the first one of us who almost got into Dave Matthews' band. But I decided to buy a different city instead. And a few years later, it's... That's a huge bonding thing for my brother and my dad that I never got it quite as much into. You know, they're from the Richmond area, right? Yep. Yep. How about that? My wife has um, some like original autograph CDs and things from the original lineup and everything back before they they changed it. And uh, she saw like Dave Matthews play some like a solo acoustic gigs in front of like twenty people at a bar when she was younger and stuff like that. So I think that's funny. And my dad would be ridiculously jealous. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so you, you, you would say then that your brother was a big influence on your musical taste then after, after your parents? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what, what happened after that, after you discovered like alternative rock? and then? So I, I assume you're referring to like DC 101 and HFS, WHFS, uh, 99.1 and um, 98 Rock, those kind of stations? Yeah, yeah, and I think even like when I was younger, I veered more towards DC 101 and uh, HFS because 98 Rock was at the time too hard for me 
Too much hair metal. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so what what happened next? Uh, then pretty much I was pretty much stuck to like a complete single groove of like the alternative rock. Like, I had no patience or concept really much for other genres of music. But then with the car rides to college, you introduced me to metal and hardcore and the punk that wasn't like the pop punk of Green Day or Blink. I don't recall listening to a lot of punk back then. What I what I recall listening to on our rides consisted largely of the stuff that I was into at the time, namely bands like, I'm going to go with like Fear Factory and Deftones, obviously, Korn, Spine Shank, um, probably Little Limp Bizkit, I'll, I'll freely admit that, but only the first CD. Um, what else I listen to? I, uh, I listened to some Jonah and Far at the time. I listened to, uh, I remember playing some Incubus, Cold Chamber, all those those kind of like like new metal bands. But then, I, yeah, I, I remember I, I was into Throwdown and Hatebreed, some of the hardcore stuff, Soulfly, of course, Soulfly. Um, and so, what you were in alternative rock, as was I before I got into metal. What, what would you say, like the the tipping point was for you that got you that that got your you know interest going in in that heavier stuff probably deftones white pony hearing um change and the house of flies was played heavily on rotation on the alternative stations then and i really liked that one song so and then like with the stuff you, you introduced me to um even then i remember like i got that cd and i liked that song and some of the I guess lighter songs but then even some of the heavier songs initially were really intense for me so, so it was a gradual process of getting into heavier stuff and so did you did you like the st- the other the metal that I played or was it kind of like hard and abrasive to listen to at the time it was on first listen but I was kind of at that point going on a I'm just going to kind of try to keep an open mind on all music and like I like even if there were some like there were some songs that were more maybe abrasive. There were other songs the same band did that I liked the more melodic side. So I was so I would give both sides a chance since I like the melodic side anyways. That's very mature of you at such a young age. Oh, okay. And then after a while, we became better friends and you started coming to some concerts with me. Would you say that that had an influence on your interest in that music? Definitely. They're pretty much, those were pretty, most of the first live shows I ever went to. Um, aside from seeing Super Drag at some free show in D.C. You saw Super Drag back in the day? Back in the day. Jealous. Yep. I only vaguely remember it, so don't be too jealous. Still, that, that's pretty cool. That was That was back before John Davis, like, took a turn never mind uh so yeah i remember you you came in i think you saw like age of ruin and apathy with us uh, was that correct or maybe uh, you saw yeah, apathy no, yeah yeah um apathy age of ruin margaret heater mm. yeah so that yeah that was kind of like the alt metal and hardcore scene that we're talking about in the baltimore dc area back in uh, like early 2000s i mean it was you know yeah about 2000 2001 was our senior year and uh oh, we just gave away our age. Oh well. So yeah. So but then you know I, I you know you got really into like Soulfly and stuff too. So you, you kind of like embraced the full on metal at one point. What, what would you say was like the the reason for that? Why why do you think that you know you fully embraced metal as a as a as a legitimate musical expression? I honestly don't know if I can explain it. Like I just. <clears throat> I think I just kind of dropped away the stereotypes of, you know, it's the scary, loud devil's music and just saw it as another form of music that had, a, you know, its own artists, its own merits of, you know, different musicians striving for different things, you know. Just like in alt-rock, you could find metal musicians that were really striving to push the boundaries of what metal could do and, you know, sonically they'd mix up the sound other than just loud, loud, loud. And they would make interesting, lyri- interesting lyrics. And, you know, then you did have, have some metal bands that fully embraced, you know, were just going to be loud and crappy, and that's all, you know. 
So I'm going to venture to say that you got into punk before I did, because I didn't really get into punk until Dave got into punk, and that kind of started more with, like, Celtic punk. Um, it, it was really the Celtic side of things that kind of got me into punk, because I have something, I don't know what it was, but something about punk music was just not that appealing to me, even though it does, it is very, I think it is very relatable to metal and the aggression, and sometimes, you know, rawness, and, um, yeah, like that raw, uh, angry uh, expression, but I don't know, I just, I just wasn't into punk, I think some of that was because I thought, coming out of high school, I had this aversion to punk, because a lot of it was... I equated to like Blink-182 and stuff like that, like, like you said, and then I, I found out later that that wasn't what punk was all about. So what, it, what, what is it that, uh, once you were firmly like a metalhead for all intents and purposes, what was it that kind of um, swayed you then to go explore the, the punk avenue of things? That, that was kind of a weird story. Um, it came from the band Link-80, which was a Bay Area hardcore ska punk band that was fronted by the now deceased son of the romance novelist Danielle Steele because she wrote a book about his issue, his struggles with um, bipolar disorder and just randomly I picked it up uh, from the library one day and read it and then checked out their music after I finished the book and I was like oh wow I actually kind of like this I like this music and then just from there I got into for some for some reason I got into um, post college the idea of punk having well, punk music having a history and the various documentations of it from photography or oral history books and for some reason I don't know why that just really became something that interested me a lot so I went from checking out the early New York scene with um, television and the Volvo, Richard Hell and the Volvoids to the LA stuff like X, the Germs, Weirdos and just for some, I don't know I like that each punk um, branch is very almost fanatically loyal to keeping track of their history of, of the movement of their music which is um, interesting because that that's just what Sam Dunn did with the with metal evolution. And, um, I, th I think I'm glad that somebody finally did that for metal. But I think I think you're right. Like it's interesting when you can kind of follow the story of of a movement of music. And punk definitely has it's very specific and, and easily definable. I think sometimes more than other other genres of music because it, it was it did kind of burn really bright for a very short period of time. You know, and, and now now it's it's you know have a real resurgence or a, whatever you want to go, a revolution. But um, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, so so now that we we're getting close to entering a new decade of our lives, and we have evolved ourselves musically, and we we've picked up all these influences over the years for various reasons. Where where would you say you're at now with music? And, and your interest, do you have, you know, do you, does one take priority over another, or do you kind of feel more balanced, um, or you, have you lost interest in, in any certain genre as you've gotten older, as some people tend to do? Uh, I think at this point, I'm pretty much open to any kind of genre, just about. Um, probably the one genre I steer clear from is pop country. I had a great argument, uh, well, not argument, it was a nicely worded discussion with um, my friend my friend's fiance and some of her friends when they I mentioned that I listened to a bit of country and they're like oh what? I said Johnny Cash and they're like oh you like twangy country. What? I was like no that's real original country. Yeah. But I mean I've got you know I listen to pretty much almost any style of music now and oddly even as I've gotten older I've become more open to, you know, mainstream pop, which was something my high school self would have been completely revolted by. Well, kudos on keeping that mature frame of mind, that openness. I wasn't always as open, which is probably why I was blasting so much metal in your ear when we were younger, but, um, yeah. So, uh, one last question before we move on to the next section about 
about the live music, did, did that, do you think that that played a big a, a part in your interest in getting, you know, getting into and exploring new musical paths? Because you seem like you go to more shows now than I do for, I mean, reasons of convenience, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, uh, how, do you, how do you feel about, you know, live music kind of playing into all this? And, uh, you know, do you see yourself continuing going to, going to live shows um, for, for the foreseeable future? Uh, absolutely, as much as I can. You know, I didn't start really going to live shows again until like a few years after college when I got closer to the DC metro area. You can just hop on a train and go down to 930 Club or Rock and Roll Hotel in DC or Black Hat. But it's just, and you know, it's the whole different experience of seeing a band live where you can be absolutely blown away by a band that you didn't like very much before or you find your one of your favorite bands does do awesome live shows or that a band that you like doesn't do such a great live show but it's just this also the sense I think of um, community and exposing different people to new music like I'm usually trying to get um, other friends who live more local who live more close to the metro area to come to shows with me as much as I can um, and I apologize to them because sometimes they haven't liked all the music I've taken them to but it's hey, you got to keep an open mind. Exactly. Okay, for the album review section of the show, we are going to talk about White Wives. Does the album have a name? Happeners. You gave me this CD. This has members of Anti Flag and who else? Um. Okay, so members from other bands. I didn't really know what to expect when you gave it to me, and the first time I listened to it. I didn't. I didn't really know what how to feel about it. So I've listened to it a couple more times. I'm feeling better about it, but I, I would like to get your take on it first and your context because um, you went and saw them live too, right? Yep. So you know more about them. You have more context for them than, than I do. So I, I'd like to get your thoughts first. And that might help me form an opinion. It was a really fun show. Um, I read. I read somewhere that. I believe it was between the two members of Anti-Flag. They had an idea they wanted to both pay homage to the kind of music they liked as younger people in the 90s. However, um, I don't remember whose was whose, but one guy was more into, like, you know, the kind of all grunge Nirvana, um, the Pogues. And then the other guy guy wanted a more uh, singer-songwriter bent, like he was talking about Neil Young. Um, from the far-off land of Canada. Okay, so what was your take on the album? I kind of, to the first time I heard it, like, I really liked the songs, and I liked that they, they were keeping a um, same sort of socially conscious lyrics as Anti-Flag is known for. name of the band, I think, even comes from, like, a suffragist, early suffragist movement. Sound-wise, I was kind of feeling like it was a mesh of the um, inspirations they were going for, but at the same time, it almost sounded like Anti-Flag and um, Gaslight Anthem mushed together, who Gaslight Anthem in turn is another band that is kind of a celebration of 80s, almost Springsteen-type rock meshed with a kind of punkier, more modern vibe. And so this new band that is an offshoot of another band sounded like, you know, several other bands gnarled together, but I still liked it. Yeah, I don't know. They just put on a, they put on a really good sh- good show in DC. They played with a uh, Beast of No Nation open for them, and they just played a really fast, tight set that that was good. Uh, that context really helps because that you basically described what I was feeling but couldn't really put in the words that I wasn't really sure what to make of the CD because it didn't feel like it was it was one cohesive album like you said it felt it did feel exactly like that like like a whole mesh and mix and mosaic of different like different styles and different directions and they were all kind of like every song kind of had a different point to it um, which I guess works for what they were shooting for to try to more like paying homage to their influences than just writing an album for writing an album's sake. Um, 
but yeah, and I uh, it's funny you said the Pogues because I uh, there was a couple songs in there I was like this sounds exactly like the Pogues, and I, I definitely see I see the grunge now, and 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 then yeah, there's there's the punk influence. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll listen to it again and kind of listen to it in that context and see how I feel. But so yeah, some of the songs definitely I, I liked more than other ones, um, and then some of them I really I just wanted to skip through because I just really wasn't feeling them. And yeah, the the singer of Anti is that Justin Sane or is it the other guy? The other guy. Yeah, whatever his name is. Um, he, he has such a distinct voice that it's hard for me to listen to him sing and not automatically think of Anti Fly. Just like Justin yeah. Sane, both of them have very distinct not just voices but like inflections as a, you know like sometimes like Eddie Vedder can go sing acoustically or, or solo and, and do other stuff and it works because I don't know he has a more to me has a more versatile voice but those guys in Anti-Flag sound like punk singers you know what I mean like yeah. so it's hard to, for me to like translate them to other styles of music sort of like um, and I always had this issue with Soulfly for a while until I just got over it was when Max would have other singers come in and guests sometimes they work really well like Burton C. Bell I thought because he has a very dynamic voice he can sing and scream and shout and coo and whatever the heck he does um, as opposed to like Tom however you say his name from Slayer like you take him away from Slayer and you got you got nothing seriously like I I I just don't some maybe it's just it's just bias on my part but sometimes you have a singer and you put them with another band or you know they guest it just doesn't work and that's why I'm really interested in this new Max and Greg from Dillinger project because the what's his name Greg is he's an amazingly versatile singer which you'd have to be for a band like Dillinger uh, I'm really interested to hear what they what they come up with because uh, I think it could be really cool um, because Max is pretty much a one-trick pony, and then Greg, really, I, I thought the the best song on Soulfly's most recent album, Omen, was with the one with Greg was the best, uh, Rise of the Fallen, because it was such an interesting, like, dynamic song. What do you think? First off, what have they started recording, or are they playing shows? Because I did not know anything about this. Yeah, they're dude. I talked about another podcast, man. You got to keep up. Yeah. They are recording. They're not playing shows. I don't know if they're going to. He, he said they're going to do like a nail bomb kind of thing, like a one-off. So they, they'll probably do it like at a festival when they perform and then leave it at that. So what, what, do, you, do you agree though? Like sometimes singers just, they, they work for what they work for and then they, it may they kind of pigeonhole themselves a little bit and then they don't necessarily as versatile as other singers. I don't know. I've never really thought about that much. Um, I mean, I guess you get in a certain, like you said, a certain mode of singing with the same band year after year. So... I guess that's definitely possible, and it depends on how versatile of a singer you are, whether you can break out of that mold really quickly or not. Like I said, it might just be a personal bias because I'm just used to hearing certain singers with other, other, you know, the certain sounds that kind of accentuate or or counterpoint or you know whatever work work with their voice in a certain way. Uh, but another example that comes to mind is when they did that Lynn Strait tribute album uh Lynn Stray from Snot called Straight Up and they had all those Snot tracks the music the in- instrumentation all done but they didn't have vocals so they got all those guest singers and some of them worked really well like Brandon Boyd is such a good singer like he, the guy can sing over anything but then they had Corey Taylor from Subnot who's also a really good singer but there's something about like Snot the the music just it didn't it didn't give his voice to me, like, I just have a hard time. It, to me, it sounds like snot with a guest vocal as opposed to, um, you know, like, like like a song that was written for Corey Taylor to sing on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Which is, I mean, obviously that's what happened because that, that's, you know. Oh, here's another good example. Uh, OzFest 2004, Ozzy was sick for the umpteenth time, had bronchitis or something. So after like a two-hour set from Judas Priest, Rob Halford comes out and sings for the entire Sabbath set. Oh. And we all, like, we left halfway through because it just got kind of obnoxious, but we were all looking at each other, my friends and I, like, wow, this sounds like a really good Sabbath cover band. <laughs> you know, and it, it just, it just after a while, like, the, the novelty, we were like, oh, it's Halford and Sabbath, how cool. And then after a while, you're like, okay, this just, it just wore out its welcome, you know, the novelty wore off because Sabbath songs weren't written for Rob Halford, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on that? I'm done.
All right, and really quick, we're going to have a short um, anticipation recommendation section because we're almost at the show. I wanted to recommend, now that it's it's complete in its entirety, uh, once again, Sam Dunn's Metal Evolution. Uh, I think Dave and I are going are gonna to do a, a whole episode, kind of a response to that, that series now that it's over. But um, I do want to recommend checking it out because it really did pay credit and validity to metal as a, as a genre that, that stands on the same stature as all other genres of music and I think Sam did a really good job. A little disappointed in the last few episodes just because he went off of the timeline of metal and just started talking about separate genres but we'll talk more about that later. Uh, what else is happening? What is going on in the musical world that we want to bring up? You got anything? Bit off tangent but I actually start reading um Violence Girl by Alice Bag, and it's going back to the roots of punk. She was one of the, um, with the LA punk scene where there were a lot of bands that, you know, they popped up for a bit and they played some songs, and then um, you never really heard from them again until history has caught up and kind of seen their place in the forerunner pantheon. Um, she she was the lead singer and lyricist of a band called The Bags and but her um, biography that she's been working on for several years finally came out um, a couple months ago and it's definitely it's not just a picture of you know her as the singer of the punk rock band but her growing up as a Latino girl and woman in um, Los Angeles and her later adult roles with social activism and trying to keep an actual ethos of real punk values alive instead of just the commercial bull. So it's been a really good read so far, so check it out. All right, and with that, our exit's coming up. When we come back, we are going to tell you all about how amazing, surely, that Machine Head 2012, Norfolk, Virginia... Machine effing head, baby. We'll be back. All right. On the road again. We are on our way back to Richmond from Norfolk, Virginia. We just got out of the Machine effing head show. Chris, what did you think? It was effing magnificent. This was your first time seeing Machine Head, so be honest. They, it was really, really good. They just had an amazing, for an almost two-hour show, they never flagged, they never faltered, and they just had a really good stage presence, a really good intensity and just kind of positivity for the feedback on the audience and feeding off of that. So I'll tell you, because I've seen them many times now, um, first time I saw them was I think it was in 2000 on the Burning Red tour um, they are like that every time they play even if it's like a big festival or you know big big uh, profile tour like Metallica they, they really they really project that kind of like positivity and I, I really liked what Rob had to say because you know sometimes rock stars get up in front of the mic and they blab on about stuff you know like what are you talking about but I, I thought he was he was very um, he was very articulate about what he was leading up to when, when before they played the Darkness Within, where he was talking about um, that you know music to him uh, and to us obviously is a necessity because it, it allows for a certain expression, you know, like getting your demons out and things like that, which is what Darkness Within is all about. I really connected with that. I thought I thought he had a really good point, and that to me that that is kind of cool because it, it for a long time in, in my life I, I've always been a little apprehensive about people you know metal fans that kind of grow out of it and that's always scared me a little bit because I didn't want to be that guy I didn't want to like be like oh yeah you know I was into that stuff before but now I'm into whatever and yeah um and yeah and yeah it's it's cool seeing guys like because they're they're probably like in their late 30s early 40s at this point and um, you know, it's, I, I appreciate that they still have that passion for it, and it makes me feel like, you know, I, I could still carry that that too, and hopefully give that passion not not just metal, but like just for music to my my kid. Um, 
and it's it's got it's bands like Machine Head that really make me feel like that uh, it could be possible or that it is possible, and it's very inspirational. And I've always felt like that after leaving one of their shows. So, what else did you like about it? For a band that has a lot of um, anti-organized religion references, I was surprised at how almost spiritual like some of the songs got and the vibe with the audience they got. Again, kind of going back to the positivity thing, I felt like there was almost like a humanist spiritual quality to some of the songs and how they really wanted the audience to absorb, you know, a connection. Like, you know, like we said, the music as a force of nature in the world and how that can be a create something good in the world at the end of darkness with him when everybody was was still singing the melody even when he stopped singing that that kind of thing that was really cool they played a, pr- a, a pretty good array of their of their career and material they played almost all of onto the locust i think like they only played a couple off of the blackie and they played halo and aesthetics of hate oh and, the, and they played uh what's the second song on there they i think they only played one song off of uh, through the ashes they played imperium and then they, uh, before that, Supercharger, they played Bulldozer, which was a lot of fun. I'm glad they, they pulled out a Bulldozer. I, every band has an album that they're always kind of iffy about. Some, some bands have that album where they, they kind of, you know, that was like a low point of their career. And I think that's definitely Supercharger for them. But they, they rock Bulldozer just as hard as the other songs. They played Blood, Sweat, and Tears off of Burning Red. I think that was it off Burning Red. And then they played... Tent on Hammer off of More Things Change. And they played Old and Divian off of Burn My Eyes. And I think that was anything. Am I missing anything? I don't think so. And then, yeah, then all the Locust stuff. Um, what, were, what were some of the moments that really stuck out to you? Yeah, I, definitely like, I definitely liked Imperium. Uh, Ashes is one of my favorites of theirs. Um, definitely the song for Diamondback, Daryl. And then just, I mean, it's a bit cliche to say it, but I really liked the, um, not the whole final closer, but kind of the unofficial closer of um, Who We Are. Yeah, um, that was the, that was really fun. That was, that, that was cool, yeah. Yeah, would you want to describe those images a little bit? Uh, I guess black and white subia pictures of fans of them and just fans of metal in general. And I, I like it wasn't just, it was just like this very ages of people and genders and, you know, just all like... Even a baby. Even a baby. I, I thought that some of the the placards that the they were holding up or the the signs that they're holding up of like why they like Machine Head didn't really bode well for like grammatical <laughs> sensibilities of metalheads. I mean, you know, you guys could throw in some pronouns here and there and just saying, you know, being being Machine Head and Rob called attention to this too that there just there just tends to be a lot of dudes at a metal show, but the the women that were around us they they rocked hard, man. And I'm you know I'm used to that too. Like metal chicks. They, they rock hard. I thought some of them, the girl in front of me was like, she was singing every single word, man. She was she was rocking. I gotta give it up to the ladies, you know. Like, sometimes women can be even more passionate metal fans than some of the guys I know. Uh, the, the girl behind me, like, when they played Bulldozer, she, she like, grabbed onto my jacket. Because I think she was so she was so into it, she didn't want to fall over. I got I was going to give her props, but then she walked away. Let's talk about, let's talk about the band that we walked in on... We missed Darkest Hour, who I think are from D.C., if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to check on that. That was uh, Jay's here, a band from a previous episode. He mentioned that. But yeah, let's talk about Suicide Silence for a second. Maybe do a little compare and contrast. Suicide Silence basically exemplifies in every single way our episode three discussion about Insane Core, where they weren't, they weren't a bad band. They were obviously very talented, but I just can't get over the, 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 the sort of like kind of... I don't know how to say it. The inconsistent rep- repetition of their songs where, to me, like, the songs were impossible to wrap your head around because they, they there was no... As opposed to a band like Machine Head who writes songs with... They have fast tempos and they have slow tempos in the same song. You know, they have breakdowns and they, they have, like, blast beats and stuff. But they have what, what are, are some musicians refer to as transitions... They, they they take you from one thing to another without without you know making your head spin like what oh, something just happened yeah and they and also bands and something I, I really have always appreciated about Machine Head especially 
after well all of their stuff they they have dynamic you know that they they know how to take you from like an explosive opening you know to to very 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 heavy powerful like verses and choruses and then they, they'll they'll bring you down to like a really quiet moment and then like build it back up and like they'll bring you to like a crescendo and a very emotional climax of a song and then you know like great solos to me suicide silence was just they were trying to pack all of all of those things into a song with no coherency at all they were, it was just like okay here we're gonna do like a super fast blast beat part and then we're gonna do some like grind chord you know groovy part and then we're gonna just do like some super slow breakdown and we're just gonna kind of like splat that out it was just like splatters and that one after the other yeah and I, I don't know, like, I, I, and to me, like, when I first walked in, I was like, yeah, heavy, let's do this. And then two songs into it, I just, I felt, you know, I felt like I was ADD, just like, I was, I was looking around and seeing what the shirts people were wearing. I was bored, you know, like, but Machine Head, they just, like, kept my attention the whole time because, yeah, I just felt, like, emotionally, you know, drawn into it. What do you think? It's just this maelstrom of various styles kind of whirling around, trying to fight on top of each other. Like, there's no, I mean, I don't know, not to sound stodgy, but there's no classical strong song structure, like you said, of going, building, and regressing, and, you know, marking the, cli- you know, the um, opening, the crescendo, and the climax. And it's not to say that it always has to be that way, but and I think Machine Head has proved that, like, you don't have to have a, a, a standard song structure to write great songs because obviously they, they've gone a little bit more in the, the progressive side of things where their songs are longer and more more complex more layered but they still they seem to like have coherency and a purpose you know like they take you on a journey where like Suicide Silence songs to me were, were they were there just to have a mosh pit which is fine like that that's great but that's just my argument uh, to why bands like Machine Head are going to live on and be influential and, and, and important you know, in like five, ten years, people are going to be like, Suicide Who? And one, no, one thing I just thought was kind of funny was that when they, Suicide Silence started their Death Wall, which I had only seen the first time before at the In This Moment show from a previous podcast. They started it up, and it just never quite seemed to come together. Well, yeah, people kept like, right, they, they didn't wait for his count. It reminded me of the um, Simpsons episode where they get the, where they have a prom and the boys and the girls are on opposite sides of the room just kind of standing there and they start towing the line they run back and... yeah. yeah I like that analogy except at a metal show it's just all dudes but still they, they don't know what to do with themselves so it seemed like like good crowd everybody was having fun um, I really I haven't been to, to a good metal show like that caliber for several years now the last one I went to was in uh, Baltimore, the Cavalera Conspiracy, and Bury Your Dead, and Dillinger Escape Plan. That was a great show, but I, I have been noticing a maybe it's just because it's the the shows I'm going to from the generation that Chris and I are from. But I feel like our, the crowd's been thinning a little bit since the days of like back when I used to go see Fear Factory and Soulfly at 9:30 Club, and it would be sold out and packed to the brim, and it would just be like every song everybody's jumping up and down I feel like people are a little more like stationary and just not not as into it but I, I was glad to see when Rob was telling people to you know jump up and down that people were getting into it so that was that was exciting but I I'm hoping that by the time my kids old enough to start going to shows that you know that there will be some uh, resurgence of heavy music and I can show them what, what it's you know it's really like to go to a great show with great energy and have it packed from like back to front and just everybody's into it that that was like the Deftone shows that I've been to and things like that I've never you know I've never seen like a weak crowd at those kind of shows but I, I feel like older metal bands are bringing in smaller but even that like those younger metal bands that we saw at the um, the All Stars tour yeah it was similar it was like there was a lot, a lot of people there it was, it was a good sized crowd but it wasn't like I don't know. It didn't. It didn't seem like it was uh, critical mass. And I've almost felt like that's a symptom, like all across the music genres, like not even just metal shows, but some of the other shows I've been to lately. Um, like you can tell who the hardcore fans are, you know, or the up at the front, or the you know the most enthusiastic. But then there's like people, you know, that it doesn't 
clubs really aren't filling up capacity these days. And then you just have the people who are there. They almost just feel like, you know, they're just coming to check. They heard there was a show, so oh, what the heck, let's go and hang out. I mean, you can, you can cut this if you want, but I hate to say it, but the largest crowd I've seen since probably at a show since high school was the Adam Lambert show at the 930 Club where really? we were packed in like sardines. Oh. Of course, it was like, you know, fangirls who, you know, you feel like we're there less. Some of them were probably there less for the music and more for the image. That's a good point, though. I, um, Maybe what I'm reacting to is the way the way things were when th- when this genre of music was more popular and when the economy was better. Maybe those both of those things played into it because you know when people have more spendable money, they will they'll go to see more concerts more freely and on weeknights. You know, a lot of the bands that I, I was into when when I was going to those shows like Soulfly and Fear Factory and uh, Deftones and um, and Machine Head like. They, they were they were probably more popular because that music was a little more mainstream so it probably brought in lesser like lesser interested fans but but people that wanted to just go to a good metal show as opposed to now where it's like you just got the the loyalists coming out the, the really hardcore fans so yeah I, I hear what you're saying and I, I think that that's a good point I gotta so anyway all in all great show love machine F and head I love that everybody was chanting that in between every song definitely definitely shows how into it people are and I, I really got to give props to Machine Head for uh, staying relevant this long they, they're super, super impressed by that I have a feeling that they're, they're going to keep going for a while I like too they brought up the point that you know their longevity has been from you know their own work and the fans loyalty and enthusiasm and not from you know what's becoming the way you get to be a huge band today whether you know inter- you know internet singles or music videos it's not from any of that stuff yeah and that's something that I've been saying about them ever since the beginning when I first got into them and saw them a few times was that I, I noticed that they were always super honest like even when they I remember when they when they after um, Supercharger came out and they, they were very honest about on their blog and stuff about what was happening with the band and, and they were they were very open with their fans about you know what, what the mistakes they felt that they had made and what they were going to change and you know what what their fans thought about it um, and and they were they bring that on stage too like they, there's a lot of feedback and they definitely react to the crowd and and you know like he he Rob was really good at connecting like he told a story about shooting the the video for uh, I think it was Aesthetics of Hate with the Al- Alama God tour at the at the Norva yeah. back in um, when they were when they were on, on that tour with Alama God touring for the Blackening um, you know that made made people feel really like connected to that that show and being at the Norva and everything and I think um, I think Rob he's always been like that he, he just walks out he like you know is always holding his glass out and oh that's what I was gonna say. There was a guy in front of us. You see the guy with the baseball mitt? Yeah. That was hilarious. This guy, he obviously had seen Machine Head before and knew that <laughs> Rob throws his plastic cups of beer out in the audience. And he had a baseball mitt, and he was, like, kept pointing to it, trying to get Rob, but Rob didn't see it. And they always do that. They, they stick around after the show, you know, and they don't just run backstage. Like they, they'll hang out for a second and, like, drink a beer and throw picks out and sticks and stuff and, you know, like, thank everybody and... I, I think uh, I've always really responded well to that. I think they're, you know, a lot of their fans do. They just that honesty and that that passion that they that they bring to the table. And that's why they're one of my favorite bands. Um, so, any final thoughts? When can we see them again? Uh, hopefully, they'll do another do another yeah. tour. You know, they're they're not un, unknown to do uh, more than one tour cycle for one album. So, all right. On that note, we're going to try to stay awake in our long drive back to Richmond, listen to some tunes. So uh, please, if you have any, if anybody's out there listening to this, please write, give us feedback on our blog, or hit us up on email, or check us out on Twitter, and let us know what you think, and uh, and send in ideas, and maybe someday we'll start doing themed write-ins and things. So send us your feedback, and we'll talk to you later. Good night.
All right, to wrap up this episode, I'm going to play you a song by a band that Chris discovered for me from Maryland, where he's from. This is Katie's Got Guts, and I'm going to read this right from their website so I don't mess it up. Katie's Got Guts is a band of four members ready to take on the world with their music. Originating from Maryland, they play a sound that is a mix between punk and rock with a bit of classic rock. They are united with a vision and have the uniqueness that only a true artist could bring to the table. Jacob is on keys, guitar, and vocals. George is on the bass. Kyle is on the guitar, and Philip is on the drums and backup vocals. Their influences range from Reliant K, ACDC, Green Day, and Badfinger. Also including, I'm going to sum up here, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Misfits, Rancid, Social D, uh, AFI, Switchfoot, Ray Charles, Boston Sticks, Beatles, and so on. Um, so here is a contemporary band for once, and they are a local band. Check them out. Katie's Got Guts. Oh, and the song is Velvet Gun. A soap impression of Mother Superior She doesn't miss much when she lies for a multi-colored deal For once you'll see through but she told him and knew what he couldn't say He really gave her no choice at
The main website for this podcast is bumusiccast.wordpress.com. Please leave us feedback there in the comments section, or please email us at breathingunderwater1 at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at breathingunder, but I'm only really going to post when we have a new episode available. Other than that, there's not going to be much other web presence for now. I'm just trying to keep things simple. So if you need to contact us, WordPress or email is probably the best bet. All views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the persons expressing them and have no relation to the companies, artists, or bands discussed. In addition, the participants of this podcast claim no rights or ownership of the musical media, songs, sound clips, etc. presented in this podcast, which are solely for promotional purposes. If there are any issues with any content presented in this podcast, please contact us and we'd be happy to take care of it. So please do not sue us or be a hater. Thanks for listening.